In this section, we will discuss how to compute two different types of fractal dimensions, the capacity dimension and the correlation dimension. We'll begin our discussion with how to calculate the capacity dimension for a general object. We'll then slightly shift gears about how to calculate the capacity dimension of a reconstructed attractor using delay cord embedding. Finally, we'll discuss how to compute the so-called correlation dimension of an experimental time series using the Grassberger and Bracaccia algorithm. Let's begin our discussion with the capacity dimension. Recall from unit 7.5 that the capacity dimension, also known as the box dimension, or the box counting dimension, is defined by the following formula. The idea with this is that you're covering your object with balls of size epsilon, or boxes of side length epsilon, and determining how many boxes it takes for each given epsilon. Remember with this formula, epsilon is the side length of each of the boxes, and n epsilon is the number of boxes of side length epsilon it takes to cover an object. In the previous unit, and in the quizzes and homeworks, use the middle third, middle fifth, and middle two fifths removed Cantor set to build some intuition about how this formula works. In the previous unit, we were able to calculate the capacity dimension of the unit line, the unit square, the middle third, middle fifth, and middle two fifths removed Cantor set by hand. In all of these cases, this limiting term, the limit as epsilon goes to zero from the right, did not end up playing a role. However, if you calculate the capacity dimension of slightly more complicated objects, such as this one, the limiting term does end up playing a role. However, there's a nice numerical approximation we can do to get around this limit. To do this, we need to understand something called a power law, and this will introduce the concept of a scaling region. To begin, remember from a previous unit, we showed that this relation holds. In particular, we showed that for an object of dimension d cap, the number of balls of size epsilon needed to cover that object was proportional to 1 over epsilon to the capacity dimension. In this discussion, we will assume that the proportionality constant k is equal to 1. This simply relates to scaling the object up or down, but has no effect on the capacity dimension itself. While it was very easy to show that this relation held for the line and the square by simply picking epsilon and seeing how many balls of that size epsilon it took to cover an object, it became a little bit trickier when we were looking at objects like the Cantor set. To do this, we needed to solve this equation for d capacity by taking the log of both sides, rearranging it a little bit, and then taking the limit as epsilon goes to zero, arriving at the standard definition of capacity dimension. If we back up one step from this limiting step, we will see a practical way of estimating the capacity dimension in practice for both standard objects and objects reconstructed using delay cord embedding. To get a closer look at this formula, what this says, if we were to calculate the number of epsilon balls needed to cover the object for a range of epsilon, and we were to plot this on a log-log scale, if a straight line appears, then the slope of that line will be an approximation of the capacity dimension. Here, I have carried out this experiment for a chaotic trajectory of the Lorenz equations. On the x-axis, I have plotted the log of 1 over epsilon, and on the y-axis, I have plotted the log of the number of epsilon balls needed to cover the Lorenz attractor. As you can see, we can break this plot into three regions. The first and third region are numerical artifacts. I encourage you to take some time to think about what are causing these two artifacts. I'll give you a hint. One of these two regions is caused by every data point being covered by a single epsilon ball. So epsilon changing doesn't affect the relationship between the number of epsilon balls needed and epsilon. The other region is caused by the epsilon ball being so large that the entire attractor is being covered by one epsilon ball. I encourage you to think for a second about which is which. The middle region is the interesting region for us. In the literature, this region of a log-log plot, when studying a power relation such as this one, is called a scaling region. The slope of this straight line will be an approximation, in this case, of the capacity dimension. This gives us the tools needed to practically estimate capacity dimension for a general object. What we will do is we will calculate the number of epsilon balls a particular size epsilon for a range of epsilon, make a plot like this, and then fit a line to this so-called scaling region. This will give us an approximation of the capacity dimension for a particular object. Let's carry out this algorithm for an interesting object step by step. The first step in this algorithm is to cover the object with boxes of size epsilon. Let's begin with an epsilon of 0.25. We then need to count the number of boxes that were needed to cover the object with this size epsilon. In this case, 12 boxes were needed to cover the Julia set using an epsilon of 0.25. We will now choose a smaller epsilon and repeat this process. Remember to record the number of boxes and the epsilon used at each stage. We will need this in the second stage of the algorithm. If we now pick an epsilon of 0.125, we will see that we need 32 boxes to cover the Julia set. If we continue cutting each one of these boxes in half, we'll see that we need more and more boxes. In this case, we needed 93 boxes, 265 boxes, 
798 boxes, 2,381 boxes, 6,827 boxes, and finally, 19,214 boxes. At this point, every point is covered by its own box, or its own epsilon ball. What this means is that even if I were to make epsilon smaller, this would not change the number of boxes needed any farther. If I continued, for example, halving epsilon again, n epsilon would not change, and we get one of those plateaus that we talked about earlier. The next stage is to plot log of the number of epsilon balls needed versus log of one over epsilon. In this plot, I have done that for this Julia set. As you can see, on this log log plot, we get a very nice straight line. This straight line has slope 1.53, which is an approximation of the capacity dimension of the Julia set, assuming this power law relation. As an aside, this general algorithm can be used to calculate the capacity dimension of interesting real world objects such as trees and coastlines. For example, this picture of a tree. Oftentimes, trees have very interesting fractal structure. If we continue this process as before, and we record the number of epsilon balls needed, and epsilon at each step, we see that the fractal dimension of this tree picture is 1.83. In the homework for this section, you'll write up some code to calculate the capacity dimension of a two-dimensional projection of the Lorenz attractor, as seen in this figure. Before moving on to correlation dimension, I want to give you a few hints as far as implementation of this algorithm, as it can be a little bit tricky to think through the first time. The first thing to realize, you don't actually have to draw this grid each time. What you should think about is overlaying a matrix on top of this picture. Sort of think about this as making the picture very pixelated, just like this. In this picture, for example, you would have a four by four matrix. Each entry in the matrix would either be zero or one. The part that can be kind of tricky is to map every element in the trajectory to one of those points in the matrix. What I recommend is coming up with a map that takes the x coordinate to an index in this matrix and the z coordinate to an index in this matrix. For example, you could take the current element in the x trajectory and map it to x minus x min divided by the current epsilon and take the ceiling of that resulting number. This would map the x coordinate to an x position in the matrix. If you did the same thing with the z coordinate, then you would map the coordinate of this trajectory to one of these squares, or equivalently, one of the indexes in this matrix. You'd then reach into that matrix using those indices and set the contents of that value to one. Once you've gone through the entire trajectory, mapping the x and z coordinates to array indexes, you simply need to take the Frobenius norm of this matrix, that is sum up all the entries in this matrix. This will provide how many boxes of size epsilon were needed, that is n epsilon. You will then need to have some kind of loop structure to go over a range of different epsilons. You will then want to plot this on a log log scale, and you will want to determine what the scaling region of that plot is, and then fit a line to that plot. This will give you an approximation of the capacity dimension of this set. Notice, if we instead set a time series from a dynamical system to then measure the fractal dimension of this attractor, the only difference between what we just did and what you need to do is that the first step would be to perform a delay coordinate embedding of the attractor. That is, you would take the time series, use the methods presented in a previous segment to perform delay coordinate embedding, and then you would do this calculation on the reconstructed attractor using the trajectory you constructed using delay coordinate embedding. Let's do a quick thought experiment. Remember that in the delay coordinate embedding process, tau should have no effect as long as it's positive on the reconstructed dynamics. This includes such things as fractal dimension, like the capacity dimension we just calculated. However, as you saw in a previous unit, the choice of tau can have a massive effect on the geometry of the reconstructed attractor. Given your knowledge of tau, and how it affects the geometry, and the algorithm I just gave you for calculating this fractal dimension, do you think it's possible that for different choices of tau, you could get different capacity dimensions? And should you?